Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. Uh, Iranian-backed militants shooting at our ships. Uh, Houthis disrupting international shipping. China spying on the U.S. while its aircraft buzzes our aircraft. Uh, Russia doing its thing. Uh, Iran uh, refining uranium. It's got enough now for material for three bombs, they say. Uh, the uh, suspected terrorists uh, pouring through our southern border, Israel at war with Hamas and Hezbollah. And that's just the tip of the proverbial iceberg, as they say. I don't know if many of you knew this, October the 7th of 1952 is Vladimir Putin's birthday. It was on that day that he completed uh, his 70th year and he turned 71. And it was on that very day that Hamas attacked Israel and Israel experienced its greatest loss of life since the Holocaust. I don't think we need to keep guessing anymore as to whether the Lord's returning soon. I believe He is. One out of every 30 verses in the New Testament mentions the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we look forward to. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the temple history. I think it's relevant. Uh, a historical overview of the holiest spot on earth, the Temple Mount, in, in which all of this has to do with. Uh, Tishbiyav, the National Day of Jewish Mourning, marks the destruction of the first and second temples on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. And to understand this, we need to go back to the beginning. According to Jewish tradition, this is the very spot the very spot of the foundation stone from which the world was created and Adam was formed from dirt taken from that spot. 1678 uh, BC, God tells Abraham to bring his son Isaac as a sacrifice to this place with the foundation stone serving as the altar. The book of Genesis refers to this place as Mount Moriah Jacob visits the same location when he flees from his brother Esau and he has his uh, fateful dream of a ladder ascending to the heavens with angels going up and down. It was in 869 BC that the Jewish monarchy uh, has been established in Israel with David as the king uh, keep that in mind. I'm going to mention David here later on. Uh, the temple in Jerusalem was not yet built. David requested permission from God to build it. And as you know, uh, many of you know, the prophet Nathan responded that it would not be David, but it would be his son Solomon who would build it. Uh, God explained to him the reason why. Uh, you shall not build a house for my name, for you've shed much blood on the ground before me. The temple could not be built until a time of peace. And so in 1827 BC, King Solomon, he dedicates the first temple. Towards the end of his reign, the prophet Gad tells David to erect an altar to God. Uh, King David purchases the mountain from the Jebusites. In 827 BC, King Solomon uh, dedicates the first temple. That temple stood for 406 years as the center of the Jewish world. Its beauty, its glory made it one of the wonders of the ancient world. Jump ahead to 423 BC, it's all lost. When Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar breaches the walls and he sets the temple ablaze on the 9th of Av. Jumping on ahead to 371 B.C. The Babylonians are supplanted by the Persians with Cyrus as their king who allowed the Jews to return to Israel and rebuild the temple. If you can believe that. Uh, but that project would be short-lived as building plans were, were thwarted and sabotaged by the Samaritans. 
they had the Samaritans had inhabited the land for 162 years and were they weren't so quick to give it up. They appealed to King Cyrus of Persia, who rescinds his permission to build a law that would remain until King Darius II comes to power in Persia and allows the building project to continue in the second year of his reign. But the second temple never quite lives up to the first temple. It actually pales in comparison to the first. There is no Ark of the Covenant. There's no cherubim, uh, no part of the high priest's garments. And that takes us up to 19 BC, shortly before the Messiah is born. King Herod, he begins refurbishing the temple on a grand scale. Uh, part of the project is to greatly expand the platform that the, that the temple was built upon. Uh, this is constructed with arches and a retaining wall. The western part of that retaining wall is all that remains of the second temple. The second temple comes under many existential threats at the hands of the Greeks and the Romans, as well as through Jews fighting amongst themselves, even though the Maccabees uh, bring temporary sovereignty uh, to Israel, their descendants fight many, many wars of succession. The sages of the Talmud identify this hatred and infighting as, as the underlying reason for their losing divine protection and uh, the destruction of the second temple. And then that brings us up to 70 AD, in which Jesus predicted that not one stone would be left upon another. Uh, so the Romans bring an end to the second temple period. And amongst the quarreling groups were the zealots who, who thought that they could actually beat the Romans. They sparked a rebellion that ultimately led to the loss of the country, the murder of uh, tens of thousands of Jews, as well as the destruction of the temple. The years that followed the destruction of the temple were very difficult years. While there was still a Jewish population in Israel, they came under constant attack and persecution by the Romans. In 117 AD, uh, a Roman emperor from uh, one, there was a Roman emperor, emperor that was from 117 to 138. He comes to power. He promises to rebuild the temple that his predecessors had destroyed. The Hellenists within the Roman Empire conspired against this. Hadrian enacts several harsh decrees in an attempt to force Jews to assimilate, uh, banning the observance of the Sabbath. And in 129 AD, Hadrian has a temple to the Roman god Jupiter built on Mount Moriah on the ruins of the Jewish temple. The community uh, naturally revolts and is uh, initially successful. The Roman governor and the Roman 10th legion are banished from Jerusalem and for two and a half years, there is Jewish sovereignty in the capital city. The Roman army puts down the rebellion with a vengeance. And once again, hundreds of thousands of Jews are murdered. The Romans systematically destroy the Jewish presence in Israel, making Torah study illegal. The uh, temple to J Jupiter is restored. The uh, Romans, they change the name of the country from Judah to Palestine. Uh, the name uh, Palestine comes from the Philistines, the, the last of the Canaanite tribes to spar with the Jews. Uh, you might take note of that, given what's going on today. By calling the providence Palestine, the Romans were trying to erase the 1,500 years of Jewish presence in the land 
and give the impression that the land was really the Philistines. And now in 312 AD, Jerusalem becomes Christian. 312 AD, Emperor Constantine the first he converts to Christianity, beginning the process of Rome and, and with it the Western world becoming Christian, including you and me. Jump ahead to 325 AD. Now Constantine has Hadrian's temple of Jupiter torn down and the church of the Holy Sepulchre built 400 meters away in the place that his mother Helena identifies as the grave of Jesus. This diverts attention away from the Temple Mount, placing the focus on the Christian site instead. The ban on Jews from Jerusalem is kept in place Constantine uh, dies, and his nephew Julian, the apostate, takes over. He tries to reverse the Roman Christian tide, and he gives the Jews permission to return to Jerusalem and build the temple. And by this time, I think maybe you might be getting the impression people don't know what they're doing here. But God did. Julian doesn't live long enough to see his, policy, his policies through, his and with his death, Rome becomes firmly Christian. In 610 AD, the Persian Empire would temporarily control Israel, also allowing the Jews to return. But their rule lasts only five years, and then the Romans come back in force, expelling the Jews once again, turning the Temple Mount into a garbage dump. And then Jerusalem becomes Muslim. In 637 AD, the Muslim conquest hits the Holy Land. Muslims build a mosque on the spot. The spot was holy because that's where Solomon built his temple. Jump ahead to 691 AD. Uh, the present structure is built. And in 1920 AD, it's, it's covered with gold. Now, back in 715 A.D., Muslims began to teach the idea that the Temple Mount was Al-Aqsa, the place referred to in the Quran from which Muhammad ascended to heaven. Of course, that was a lie. That is a lie. But it was in that spirit that they built the Al-Aqsa Mosque, also on the Temple Mount, 83 years after the death of Muhammad. And now we go back to the Christians. 1095 A.D., the First Crusade begins. Crusade. You know, uh, I could make more comments on that, but I won't. Uh, Jerusalem is conquered. 1099 A.D., the Kingdom of Jerusalem is formed. The Dome of the Rock is turned into a church. And they renamed themselves the, the Poor Knights of Christ in the, the Temple of Solomon or the Knights Templar uh, which is a term I'm sure more of you are familiar with, the, the Crusaders continued to forbid Jews to live in Jerusalem. And now we're going back to the Muslims again. 1187 AD, Muslims defeat the Crusaders and re they reclaim Jerusalem. Removed are, are all Christian symbols from the Temple Mount. Re the restored is the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. 1190 A.D., Islam makes a proclamation inviting the Jews back to Israel. Big mistake, okay? Just letting y'all know. It was a, uh, this would begin the slow trickle of Jews coming back to Israel, joining the small population that had survived everything. While the Jews were allowed to live in Jerusalem, they were not allowed onto the Temple Mount until the 19th century. This was the uh, status quo until modern times. And that kind of brings us sort of up to today. You know, the, the trickle of Jewish return became a stream after the Spanish uh, expulsion in 1492 and eventually a flow in the 19th century. By the end of the century, there would be a majority Jewish population in Jerusalem. 
And then came 1948, a day that does live in infamy. That was Israel becoming a nation again. The, the independence war, war started right away. The superiority of numbers would not be enough to fully defend the Jewish position in the old city. Israel loses the old city of Jerusalem to the Jordanians. And then that brings us to the 1967 Six-Day War. The old city of Jerusalem is captured by the Israeli Defense Force. Uh, uh, a rabbi blows a shofar and he proclaims the Temple Mount is in our hands. Uh, an Israeli flag is hoisted over the mount. The Israeli Minister of Defense orders the flag be taken down, sending a signal that religious and national matters should be dealt with separately. The Israeli government do, decides to maintain the status quo of the Temple Mount. I think the I believe the plan was that Muslim authorities would remain in charge of the Mount, and Israel would be responsible for the overall security. The one uh, change was that Jews would be allowed to visit the Temple Mount, but they could not pray there. For the most part, the status quo has remained in place. There's flare-ups from time to time. As you know, we've seen many, uh, several since the Revelation 12 sign in 2017, uh, usually sparked by radicals on either, either side. Today, Jews still mourn the destruction of the temple and the tragedies of their Jewish past. They pray for the time when they can fulfill the collective hope of the Jewish people. And I'm at least like to think that many of them believe God is doing that very thing. So here we are, 2023. What about the temple today? Well, there is no temple made with hands. We, the church, the body of Christ, we are the temple, members of the one temple, the body of Christ. And I believe this is just my personal belief that it is entirely possible that Jesus could return to Israel on a Passover. I'm talking about the second coming. I'm not talking about the rapture. Passover, April 7, 2031. If you back up 25, 20 days, it brings you to May 14, 2024, Israel's birthday. In other words, if raptured on Israel's birthday, this year, Jesus would return on Passover in 2031, entering the Temple Mount through the Golden Gate, which he entered at his first coming. Now, Israel would be 76. It'd be 77 years if you count from 1947. And I've talked about 2550 days a lot. It could be 2520 or 2550 in between the rapture and the second coming. Most believe it's 2520. I tend to take the more 2550 view, but it could be 20, it could be the former. Uh, the uh, second eclipse is April 8th. That's uh, uh, seven days uh, difference if you count from, you know, uh, if you count April 8th. Also on Passover, uh, March 25th, 2024, there's a lunar eclipse. Uh, the creation calendar uh, shows Christ raised on March 28th. That may be a high watch day. 1947 to 2017 is 70. Uh, that was the sign, Revelation 12 sign. 1947 to 27 is 80 years. 2017 to 2024 is seven years between the eclipses. If you look at 30 AD to 2030 AD, that's 2,000 years. We've got this 2030 agenda stuff and you know, uh, you know, it's just a lot of interesting numbers that seem to indicate we're at this crucial time in prophetic history. According to the biblical narrative, King David was 30 when he became king in 1010 BC. This means that King David was born sometime near 1040 BC, died at, at the age of 70 in 970 BC. If you take and add 970 to 2023, you get 2993. Uh, plus seven years tribulation is 3,000. So did David die at the halfway mark of the 6,000 years? 
If not, it would have been eerily close to it. I believe the Lord is, His return for His church is near because of not what is much of, 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 about what is going on in front of our eyes today, but just the time, we're, the, the, the year that we're living. If you believe as we do, in the 6,000 years of man, 1,000 years kingdom, 7,000 year pattern, patterned after six days in the week, of the week and the rest of, on the Sabbath. If, if you believe in that and you're not a, you know, an evolutionist, and you, you take the, the, the creationist view and the literal interpretation of Scripture, folks, we are at the end. We're at the end. And, and uh, so I encourage everyone to look, keep looking up. Uh, I believe we are going home soon. I hope that you find this somewhat encouraging. We're in the right time frame. Israel became a nation. God's bringing his people back to the land for judgment. We've got all this flaring up in the Middle East, which, and, and I want to make one mention of, of the Psalms 83 war. Uh, I've got a message. Someone asked, do you still believe that this is Psalm 83? Yes, I do. I. I think it's a mistake to look at the Psalm 83 war as some event that's just going to occur out of the blue, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, uh, Israel's going to be victorious and ex their territory will expand and this will take place over a short period of, per of time where we can go, oh, that was Psalm 83. I don't think that's how it happens, folks. I believe that the wheels of prophecy turn slowly. I think that we are looking at at least the, the preface to Psalm 83 the entrance to Psalm 83. I do not see this going away, any of this going away. Do you?